good day, and welcome to the professors at McMurray University. I'm Paul Fabrizio. I'm Don Frazier, and we're joined by Wayne Keith, another professor yes. at McMurray University. And our first repeat guest. Well, I, Really? I did not know that. He's that he, good. He's that good. <laughs> and so, y'all bird walked him last time, so this time he gets to actually, you know, Tell some important stuff. That's right. That's right. <laughs> we had fun, though. We yeah, we did. And at that time, we had a, you weren't here, Don. Correct. So we had a guest host then. Mm-hmm. See, Christopher I'm here Bartlett. to keep everybody he did, on He track. asked some really good questions. So. He about did. Movies he, and stuff. It was great. Yeah. So we need to just remind everybody who you are. So, yeah. Okay. So Keith, take it away. Okay. Keith, so, Keith, <laughs> Keith. No, my, Wayne, Wayne. My name is Wayne Keith, and I'm <laughs> professor of physics and astronomy here at McMurray. And I've been here since 2006. And before that, I was teaching at uh, Angelo State. Before that, I was at the NASA Goddard Space Flight Center for a postdoc. Dang. And NASA Goddard Space Center is in? Is in Greenbelt, Maryland. Okay, very good. And you call yourself a space physicist. Is that correct? That's right. So we distinguish space physics from astronomy. The, the quick and dirty way to do it is if you go there with a satellite, it's space physics. If you look at it through a telescope, it's astronomy. It's okay. a little bit more subtle than that, but that's quick and dirty. Like, <laughs> Do you oh, ever like use a telescope then, or you just not Actually, I never used a professional-grade telescope until I came to McMurray. And McMurray's part of the National Undergraduate Research Observatory, Neuro. And so when they were interviewing me, they said, hey, we're already members of Neuro. And, um, you know, Rick Thompson was here before me. He, yeah. he, had, he had gotten us in on that. And, uh, you know, when Joe Christensen was interviewing me, he said, okay, well, if, you, if we hire you, would you be able to take students out? to the telescope. I'm like, sure, you know, because I'm wanting the job, right? Yeah. <laughs> Where is this place? Flagstaff? Where's Flagstaff? Let's do that. <laughs> and what's a telescope? Right, right. So, I mean, I'd, I'd done, I'd taken some astronomy courses because it, it Rice as a graduate student. Um, it was at the time the, the Department of Space Physics and Astronomy. They've since merged with physics and become just physics and astronomy. But when I was there as a, in the Department of Space Physics and Astronomy, they made sure that every, no matter which track you were on, you took some of both. So the astronomy guys took some space physics, and the space physics guys took some astronomy. So I, I did have uh, enough astronomy that I could, you know, Fake it till you made it. I could fake. I could fake it. So, <laughs> I, I'm, I'm but I've ju- taken students out there like six or seven times now. So it's gotten to be kind of pretty regular thing for me now. That's cool. Okay, that's I'm, a pretty I'm, nice facility out there. Too. Yeah, it's 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 really it's neat. It's a cool it's, trip. It's it's nice because you know a lot of other uh, research grade telescopes. Um, even if they allow undergraduates to use it, there's always like a babysitter. There's yeah. there's, there's somebody there's just somebody right. who works for the for the uh, observatory who who uh, you know doesn't really let you do anything on your own. But for better or for worse, they just, after the first night, they have somebody to kind of make sure you know the ropes. And then they just turn you loose. They give you the keys to the observatory and say, okay, you know, do what you want to do and be sure you lock up when you're done. You wow. Know, turn everything off. <laughs> that explains the <laughs> fingerprint on all the photos they're taking. <laughs> right. So, and there, there have been groups that, you know, haven't done things properly. They've, oh. they've gotten kicked out of neuro. It's happened. Yikes. But, but um, not McMurray University. McMurray, well, I, I I did mess up once. <gasps> yeah. This was not my most recent trip, but the trip before last was like three years ago. Um, it turns out that, and I knew this, I just wasn't thinking. If you point the telescope too far north, it can actually get stuck. <gasps> and that's because it's a double fork mount. So it's, it's instead of just having like this with the mount and it can swing all the way due north, it has a double fork. So you can't point it due north. Oh, and and you tried to do it was, that. it was partly cloudy. We were trying to find a guide star because we had messed up the uh, the pointing accuracy. It didn't know where it was. And so we had, when you do that, you have to find a guide star and then look through a little finder, which is basically just a, a regular size telescope mounted to the side of the big telescope with just an eyepiece. And look through that and just manually drive it and steer it until it, you know it's lined up with the guide star. Then tell the computer, this is what we're looking at. And then, and then the computer knows where it is again, and it can automatically point to stuff. And so every time we'd find a bright star to try to fix the, the pointing, the clouds would get it. Ah. And so we just were scanning the sky and like, okay, look, how, how about that one? You know? And so we pointed to that one, and we just weren't thinking. And it was, it was just right at the ragged edge of how far north it was supposed to be able to point. And it, it turns out there was these little weights you know, that you have to get everything balanced. One of the weights just happened to, to get caught on the on the the upper half of the mount and it got hung (laughs) 
it got it hung. got hung. It got, Is that like was, a hung telescope? It was. Tennis? It was a hung. So so I, I first I did. You know, there's a, obviously an all night guy on call that we call if we have trouble. So I call <laughs> no. I call Ed and and he was like, well, try doing this, try doing that, because when it's real close to the limits, it goes extra slow because it knows about where its limits are, but it doesn't know every possible orientation and every possible little doodad hanging off the telescope. You know, that <laughs> Some might, telescope that might run yeah, into I'm something. <laughs> so. Um, so he t- had me try a few things, and we didn't have any luck. And so he drove out there. Luckily, he doesn't live that far from the telescope. So, but it was like you know, like one o'clock in the morning. So I, can, I did feel bad. He drives out there, and we mess around with it for a while, and still couldn't get it fixed. He said, "Well, there's in the motor. There's this little um, clutch, basically that can that can uh, that's designed to break before anything else breaks." And so that that's probably broken. And and the the one of the regular Lowell maintenance guys will have to come out and fix it. But it was Saturday night. The next day was Sunday, and it was our last night observing. And oh, so I'm wow. like, please, 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 can they come out on a Sunday and fix it? Because we hadn't gotten any data the whole year, uh, the whole that whole run, because of both clouds and technical problems. And so, much much to my surprise and delight, the guy did come out on Sunday. Nothing was broken. He said all he had to do was take the cover plate off the motor, hit it with a hammer. <laughs> he turned the gears and by, used some duct tape. Right. Which no, I- he turned the gears by hand. Uh, just to get it unstuck, and then he said everything started working again. So it was a it was an easy fix, but I definitely learned a valuable lesson that you can't get too complacent. Because after several years of coming out there, I thought I you know I knew what I was doing pretty well. But but okay, that and was that was my that was my big oopsie. And they've invited you back. <laughs> and I, we did come back. We went back just last month. We were there. I okay. had, had seven students there. It's the biggest group I ever had, and we did not get a one lick of science data. So wow! First time in in all my trips that we didn't get any science data because uh, they had just finished recoding the telescope the week before, and so they had never used it. They hadn't started using. So the first night the guy comes out, this is the same guy Ed, and and he's helping us focus it because you know they'd taken the telescope all apart, so the focus was completely messed up, and he thought that he discovered some weird problem with it jittering back and forth and making the images uh what they call dog bone where it's like there's two two star images with a streak in between it turned out it was just still really out of focus but he didn't realize that um so we spent most of the week trying to get the lowell maintenance guys to come out and fix it but of course they were coming in the daytime so they couldn't really do any testing so then at night we would run tests for them to look at the next day <laughs> oh and then we also have not because it's you know august is monsoon season which was discovered is not the best time to go to the telescope so we had, you know, really bad weather. Some nights we didn't even get to open the dome because it was raining, you know, or it was just like super socked in, cloudy. And we, we, there's we just, so much that goes into time. this. We yeah, just ran know. out of time. <laughs> so, like, is wow. this why you're a physicist instead of an astronomer? <laughs> yeah. Because you, then you don't have to worry about you know, it. You with, use with satellites. And... With satellites, you definitely don't have to worry about uh, terrestrial weather. There's yeah, still space, cloudy nights. There's still space weather. There's the, the solar... What do you mean there's space there's, weather? There's space weather. Space weather. <laughs> there's okay, act... you're going to have to explain, okay, I'm gonna have to explain space that weather. Now. Okay, Please. so, in fact, that's actually uh, part of what. Um, I study is the interaction between the solar wind, which is particles streaming from the sun and the earth's magnetic field. And so that's actually what my, uh, okay. Area of specialization is actually in. And that's what causes the bubble around the solar sphere. Did I say that right? Yeah. yeah it's, actually, Heliosphere. It's, it's called, it's He's called been the study, right? The edge, the edge of where the solar wind, uh, basically interacts with the, interstellar medium is called the heliopause. Oh, so the heliosphere, you're right. The heliosphere is the sphere of influence of the sun, which basically uh, is how far our solar wind goes, the sun's solar wind goes, before it runs into the surrounding you know, gases of interstellar space. Um, and the edge... Okay. The, is it like the, a soup? No, it's, well, it's actually, uh, of course, super, super low density. You know, yeah. if you just were... Uh, Looking out the window of your spaceship, it's just space, right? It's just so you space. you're but, not talking about things you would see. No, no, there are things you can measure, right? So the solar wind has a density of about five atoms per cubic centimeter. So cubic centimeter, just think of a sugar cube, right? Okay. So in a, in the the volume of a sugar cube, five atoms. That's better than the best laboratory vacuum in, on on the Earth. If you have a really high vacuum system. You know, uh, in some vacuum chamber on the Earth, it's not that low a density. Hmm. It's going to be probably several times higher density than that. So it's not. It's so it's very very low density. It's basically a vacuum, but 
it's not nothing. <laughs> it's, it's not, not nothing. nothing. Is there something? Is there nothing? There, there's, I mean, there's no I mean, place we know of in the universe that there's there's really, nothing. really, really nothing. Even intergalactic space has some particles, but the densities there are going to be even lower, maybe a handful of particles per cubic meter instead of per cubic mm. centimeter. So the, the, the densities get so low that for practical purposes, you could call it nothing, but it's still not nothing. And there are some ways to detect those uh, those super low density those voids. Yeah. So, but the solar wind is really interesting because even though it's really low density, it's moving really, really fast. Four hundred kilometers per second. That's pretty is fast. How fast yeah, and, it's and moving that, from the sun and to and the it earth comes off the sun. Yeah, it's it's basically you can think of just the outer layer of the sun just sort of boiling off into space over you know. And, and so we can ride that right to go places. Um, there are things called solar sails that can basically use. It's like a big giant you know uh, mylar sail that can that can use that to to gain velocity but it's it's very slow obviously but since there's no drag then you know even a really really low um thrust is enough to get you going really fast eventually okay yeah. we're uh, gonna have to stop you that's a drag okay. yeah we gotta go to this break bear leader tours where will bear leader tours take you everywhere Paris, Bruges, Tria, Battlefields, Pearl Harbor, Pacific Beaches, New Orleans. Join the adventure. www.mcwinnie.org This portion of the show is reserved for advertisements. If you are interested in filling this portion with ads for your business, please call 325-793-4686 or email director at tfhcc.com. This portion of the show is reserved for advertisements. If you are interested in filling this portion with ads for your business, please call 325-793-4686 or email director at tfhcc.com. This portion of the show is reserved for advertisements. If you are interested in filling this portion with ads for your business, please call 325-793-4686 or email director at tfhcc.com. This portion of the show is reserved for advertisements. If you are interested in filling this portion with ads for your business, please call 325-793-4686 or email director at tfhcc.com. This portion of the show is reserved for advertisements. If you are interested in filling this portion with ads for your business, please call 325-793-4686 or email director at tfhcc.com. And welcome back. We're the professors at McMurray University. I'm Paul Fabrizio. I'm Don Frazier, and our friend Wayne Keith is here blowing our minds. <laughs> about and trying things, anyway. He's just getting started. Know, this man. is what is so scary about talking this to this man. This is good man. stuff. Yeah, he's, <laughs> yes, he's got that, a big 80-pound brain. <laughs> yes, now he is a space physicist here at McMurray University. Right? I just have a stupid question, okay. and you can treat it as such. Is there competition between space physicists and astronomers? Does one look at the other and say, oh, you're just a dumb astronomer? Not that, I've, not like that I've experienced. It may, there may be certain, you know, institutions and situations for that happens but as far as like you know trash talking each other and, and i haven't experienced that between space physics and astronomy guys we're, do, we're do similar trash, enough do you trash talk anybody i'm just curious <laughs> well, and I mean, i'm wondering who his, I mean, his who? favorite character is on big bang theory yeah i actually don't watch that show i'm very sorry <gasps> oh, but well, it's one of those well. kind of things where I, everybody's asking me about it so often that i think i just really need to get into this show but 
I need to start from the beginning because obviously, you know, yeah. I've tried to watch it and just watching a random episode is, is just impossible. Doesn't work. Well, and it, it might work. set your teeth on edge too when they start talking all sciencey. Well, I've heard though that the science that they talk is pretty it's pretty, pretty decent. They have yeah. some advisors for the show that actually make sure that what they're saying is not just garbage. And in fact, um, I've also been to- been told, and I've seen still pictures of when they have like junk on the chalkboard or yeah. whiteboard that it's real stuff it's they, real they, equations they have a real they have a real scientist come in and do all that before the before they shoot the show so that it's it's actually some real thing you know and it's not just garbage that some set dresser did wow so they actually have made an attempt i understand to do that so a lot of people who are into you know science and and that sort of thing are do like the show so I think I would like it. I just I need to go back to the beginning and watch it from the beginning. My my roommate in college was a, f- a physics PhD student, and at Caltech. So, no, he was at USC. Oh, where USC. I was. Okay, yeah. And yeah. Um, he was in laser physics, and it so much reminds me of living with him. <laughs> <laughs> the show really strikes home for me. Right, so. right. <laughs> well, right. speaking of stuff that I haven't seen, okay, what okay. dark matter? Dark matter. Well, you're not alone because nobody's seen dark matter. Okay. <laughs> well, there. And, and in fact, that's how it got its name. I just assumed that that was the interstellar medium. No, uh, the interstellar medium is made up of mostly hydrogen gas, and we can totally see it. At least at certain wavelengths, it actually will either give off light or absorb light so that we can tell that it's there. And that's kind of the froth at the edge of the heliosphere. Right, it, it, yeah, the the, the, the froth. The, that's what that's what I've seen it described. The, as. the edge of the heliosphere, the heliopause, is yes. where the the solar wind basically runs into just the medium between the stars, the interstellar medium. So you can think of the solar wind blowing a certain size bubble in the interstellar medium, and that's the heliosphere. Okay, and I've heard it. It looks like theoretically, it's like froth, froth like, like bubbles. beer froth. Yeah. Or something. yeah. <laughs> so I mean, I'm just to define it in my head. Mm-hmm. We have the sun, we have the solar system. What are you talking about in terms of this heliosphere? So the heliosphere is... Is, is this, it beyond Pluto? It's way beyond Pluto, yeah. Um, I'm trying to think what the current number... It's somewhere between 50 times and 100 times the distance from the Earth to the sun. Wow. So it's really far out there. To give you an idea, uh, Pluto's about 40 times further out from the sun than the earth is. Our, so it's our, definitely beyond Pluto. Our, our Viking spacecraft, which are still heading out, right? Uh, what, have they gone past this? Voyager, you're thinking of. Voyager. Voyager. Right. Viking went to Mars, I think. My apologies. But yeah, uh, there's, the, there's a couple of Pioneer spacecraft. And there's a couple of, <laughs> there's a couple of the Pioneer spacecraft <laughs> and there's a couple of uh, Voyager spacecraft that are, that are all really far out. I'm not sure if we're still in contact with the Pioneer ones, but the Voyager okay. ones, we're still, we're still in, in touch in, with. And one of them's gone past the heliopause, right? Yeah. Well, the problem is that the the the, the heliopause moves ah. because as the solar wind varies in its strength and density and speed and all these things, it'll it'll you know billow bulge. out and, and yeah. bulge out and come back in. And so the spacecraft is moving much slower than than that boundary moves. Oh. And so what will happen is it'll move past us this way, and then it'll move past us that way. And so it's hard to know exactly uh-huh. where to pin it down because we haven't gotten, as far as I know, we haven't gotten completely outside it. We're always outside. Mm-hmm. So so now we're sometimes outside, sometimes inside. So we're nowhere, we know we're near the boundary because it keeps passing over us, but we don't know how, what, how far it ever goes. It'll be cool to once find out to, what's out there. Yeah, once we get to the point where we're always outside, which is possible it's happened and I missed it, but... But um, once we get to the point where that spacecraft is always outside the heliosphere, then we'll know that, okay, it, it's, that's the extent. It never goes past and, that and point. And that point then, when it's totally outside of the mm-hmm. heliosphere, that's interstellar space? Yeah, what, what, is that is that what we call it out there? I yeah, think. yeah, that's what we would call it. Just but it's not the space. same as dark matter. No. Still not the same as dark matter. Okay. In fact, just, just in interstellar space, we don't really see dark matter. It's probably there, but the way we detect dark matter is looking at the scale of galaxies. We don't really see, we don't ah. really see or measure. If, if we were just uh, limiting ourselves to looking at nearby stars, we wouldn't have any reason to think that dark matter existed. Because when we, when we see evidence of dark matter, is we're looking at the scale of galaxies, starting with our own galaxy. And that's kind of the way it started is we were um, trying to figure out 
the extent of the Milky Way galaxy. How, how big is it? How much does it weigh? And it turns out that because of new, how much does, how much it, does weigh? it weigh? Well, I, a better thing is how, what it, what's its mass? Because of course, weight depends on uh, you know gravity. Ooh, but Milky Way, you need to stop eating yeah. Milky Ways. But, <laughs> but the nice thing is uh, Newton's laws and Kepler's laws give us a nice way to measure the mass of something. For example, we can tell what the mass of the, the sun is because we know how far the Earth is away from it, and we know how long it takes for the Earth to go around it. And there's only one solution to, you know, if we know how far away we are and how fast we're going around, what the period of rotation is, there's only one solution, and it depends on the mass of the body you're orbiting. And so all you have to do is, is have something. And so that's one reason why, for example, we didn't used to have a real good number for the mass of Venus because it doesn't have any moons. Huh. There was nothing orbiting. Yeah, Venus. no uh, point of reference then. But once we sent Magellan, which was a, a spacecraft in the '80s, and we put it in orbit, I think the Russians had done it earlier. But but you know, we put Magellan in orbit around um, Venus in the '80s, and then we were able to get a really pinpointed mass for Venus because we had an artificial satellite that we put in orbit. So so how do you measure the mass of a galaxy? Because there's no way we're going to have a satellite going around it. Good good point. Well, everything, all of the st- all of the stars. <laughs> I get points for that. Yeah, yeah that's science. Points. All of the stars. That's the are political orbiting, science. <laughs> all of the stars in the galaxy are orbiting around the center of the galaxy. Oh, so you do have points. So you do right. have. Ah, you but got tons of. You yeah. can't just use any star because, just like with, with the solar system, we could pick any planet and it would work for the sun because almost all of the mass of the solar system is concentrated in the sun, like ninety nine point nine percent. Sure. But that's not true with the galaxy. The, the mass is distributed throughout all the stars. And so if we looked at the rotation of the sun around the center of the galaxy, it only it only measures how much mass is within that circle. Mm. And I, I could prove it to you with math, but you don't want me to go no, there. No, I don't. But, but the way it works out is all the mass beyond your orbit cancels out. It doesn't matter. Only the mass that's enclosed within your orbit matters as far as how fast you go around the center. Okay. And so looking at how fast the sun goes around only tells us that much mass. But we can find a star out on the edge of the galaxy and watch that and watch it that should tell us so on a wider loop that should tell us the mass of the entire galaxy but when they tried to do it it didn't work what dun, dun, dun. what do you mean it didn't work <laughs> you threw a wider loop i've seen the math or at least you every time the math. every time they would pick a star farther out even when there didn't seem to be any many other stars out there they would get a bigger number for the mass and so mm. these these bigger and bigger circles were enclosing more and more mass but there was no stars out there to see Okay, now that's the origin of the idea of dark matter. Dark matter. Okay, so that's probably a good place to stop, don't you think? Holy that? smoke, my <laughs> mind is blown we're, yet again. We're just beginning. We're yeah. just beginning. This, as this we is just step this. one. All right, next yeah. segment: dark matter. We'll be right back. When you support McWinnie History Education Group, you also support the many young workers who operate and maintain the company's digital operations. These are dedicated university students who handle many things such as filming, recording, and editing content from McWinnie, as well as cultivate the layout and structure of McWinnie's various websites, including its associated channel on YouTube. We are a nonprofit organization that exists from donations from interested persons and history enthusiasts alike. Donations enable our students to obtain a higher education, job training, and career bolstering skills. If you would like to donate, please visit us at www.mcwinnie.org and click on our About Us tab to learn more. This portion of the show is reserved for advertisements. If you are interested in filling this portion with ads for your business, please call 325-793-4686 or email director at tfhcc.com. This portion of the show is reserved for advertisements. If you are interested in filling this portion with ads for your business, please call 325-793-4686 or email director at tfhcc.com. This portion of the show is reserved for advertisements. If you are interested in filling this portion with ads for your business, please call 325-793-4686 or email director at tfhcc.com. 
This portion of the show is reserved for advertisements. If you are interested in filling this portion with ads for your business, please call 325-793-4686 or email director at tfhcc.com. This portion of the show is reserved for advertisements. If you are interested in filling this portion with ads for your business, please call 325-793-4686 or email director at tfhcc.com. And we're back. And this is Paul Fabrizio. I'm Don Frazier, and we're about to discuss Dark Matter with Wayne Keith. Dark Matter. And, of course, Wayne Keith is our space physicist. Yeah. I love that title. That I is really cool. That's, yeah, so you much know, cooler than astronomer, and just the way it lays on my brain. I know, yeah. I know. Space physicist. Yeah. <laughs> and, and astronomers is better than just physicists, I've noticed. If you, if you, if so I you tell see, people... See, there is a hierarchy. There well, is, yeah. You're it, it, he it. denies it, but well, there is I, a hierarchy. I, better in the sense of when you tell someone you teach physics... They wrinkle their nose, yeah, because they remember their experience, you know, as yeah. a student uh, trying to learn physics, either whatever level. But if you say, "Oh, I teach physics and astronomy," oh, I love astronomy, you know, yeah. they want to talk about. I remember the, stuff. the labs out in the park with all. So the, yeah, yeah, people have Looking much more pleasant moon. memories of astronomy yeah. than physics. And then so. space physics, whoa, space must physics, yeah. be really smart. <laughs> yeah, that's like made out of space titanium, yeah, exactly. as opposed to just regular yeah. titanium. <laughs> okay, so we're talking about dark matter. Yes. And apparently this all came about because you we're trying folks to figure, measure the mass trying to of figure the out Milky the mass Way. of the Milky Way and they thought, well, we just have to find a star out at the edge and that'll enclose the entire mass and we'll be able to get a number. And then any star we find beyond that should give us the same answer, should give us the same mass because we're not really enclosing any more stars. Sure. But when they would they did that, they found that every star they found further out gave them a bigger number for the total mass of the Milky Way. Even way, 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 way out. And does does that mean that there is a definite boundary of a galaxy? Yeah, how or, do you know when a galaxy yeah, ends? Well, I'm, there's I'm, there's there's not really. And so um we usually say that the Milky Way is about um a hundred thousand light years across. I think that's the right number. And so it's how many parsecs is that? <laughs> well, there's about three and a quarter uh, light years in a parsec. See, I just threw that out there because I heard it one <laughs> time in a movie. Sorry. Yeah. Parsec is definitely a distance. Wow. And we can talk about Star the definition Trek. of parsec. No, no. Star Wars. <laughs> Star yeah. Wars. It so was in Star Wars. The Kessel Run was less than 12 parsecs. But they've actually retconned that now. So you got me started. <laughs> no, 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 no. Back they retconned that. They okay, <laughs> we got to go back to dark matter. Yeah. All right, back, back to dark, dark matter. matter. Pull them back. Oh, well, I'm going to be talking about leagues and labors and fathoms. And no, I was just like going to talk about the solo movie, but we, we can do that later. Okay. All right. So... Um, they kept finding more and more mass. They get farther out. And even though there's, as you're, you're right, there's no definite edge to the galaxy. There's definitely the point at which there doesn't seem to be very many more stars. And so you get to a point where there's onesie twosie stars instead of, you know, millions and millions more stars. Very precise. That's a, that's, a, that's a technical term. Physics term. It's a physics term. So, huh. so they, they couldn't figure out why was there more and more mass, even though there weren't really that many more stars being enclosed by these orbits. Okay. And so they said, well, there must be some kind of matter we can't see. And it's probably dark. It's Well, yeah, the dark comes from the fact that it doesn't seem to emit any light in any wavelength. It doesn't seem to absorb light in any wavelength. And so it's basically invisible. But yet it has mass because, it, you know, the more of it we enclose, the more mass we we get for the answer for the mass of the Milky Way. And so hmm. anything with anything that, that has mass is matter, and anything we can't see is dark, so dark but, matter. But... You can't see it. Right. You can't measure it. We can measure its mass. Right. Because but you, it's, but you, it's but the X in the equation well, for. Yeah. But there's no proof that it exists except that it has mass. Yes. Yeah. So but, it's but something. There, there's you, missing mass that we can't account for with the with the visible matter that we see. There's X. There's more mass than the matter we see. And so the extra matter we can't see we call dark matter. And I agree with you. If it was just if this was the only evidence. That seems really shaky. Yeah, I hate exactly. to say it. And, and, you know, and I would question whether your calculations. And are you're correct. not alone. There was a lot of people who said maybe we just don't understand the strength of gravity. Maybe at these large scales and these large distances, the whole gets weaker with one over r squared thing. Maybe that 
breaks down. Maybe it doesn't work. And so people came up with alternative theories of how gravity gets weaker with distance over really long distances to try to come up with an alternative explanation. And if this was the only evidence we had, then I would say they had a good point, and that may well be the answer. And for a long time, the only evidence we did have what had to do with the total mass of a galaxy being more than we thought. The next one came about when they started looking at clusters of galaxies. So you have clusters of galaxies, multiple galaxies interacting gravitationally with each other. So you can think about two galaxies orbiting each other. Yeah, right. It happens really slowly, but we can measure you know, their speed and their distance, and we can calculate the mass using that method. And when they do that, looking at how uh, galaxies interact with each other gravitationally, they get the same answer. There's more mass... Like then there ten, should be. Like 10 times more mass, a lot more mass. Wow, I mean, a, a lot, lot more. A lot more. <laughs> yeah, that's a not lot just... More. Oh, not just well. like a little bit of error, but just like 10 times more yeah. than what they thought should be there because, looking at just the stars. Dang. That, okay. Then, then that so, would make you kind of go, what? Yeah. <laughs> and, so, and so, but still people were thinking, well, maybe the mass of the actual stars you see, maybe it's just stronger than we thought it should be, right? Maybe the math is wrong and the, gra- and the, and the, the gravity is just stronger. And so as long as... The gravity was centered at the same point, the center of the galaxy, but just stronger than you could make a case that maybe we just don't understand gravity. Mm-hmm. Um, but then came something called the bullet cluster. Okay. Mm. What, when are we talking about this happening? Well, uh, as far as when these the, discoveries like this, were made. Yeah, this bullet cluster. And- uh, the bullet cluster, uh, I think that's pretty recent, last 20 years or so. Okay, so we're talking stuff that just yeah. occurred since we took astronomy in college. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Now, now the, the well, idea of dark matter goes back, <laughs> I think, about a, almost 100 years. So the idea of dark matter is pretty old, but okay. that was when they were first doing these, these trying to figure out the mass of the galaxy things, and it wasn't really in the mainstream yet, even among astronomers. It was just kind of this outside, like, here's a weird thing we don't really understand, you know, but nobody had really... Dr. Poindexter's <laughs> down the hall doing some weird stuff that no one cares about. Yeah, yeah so, so it, it got to be more of a, a mainstream idea in part of the last 50 years or 40 years. Okay. And then, and then there's been new information and, and better techniques and, and, and better evidence. That's just in the last 20 years. Okay. So tell us about this bullet. Cluster. Okay. So the, the idea of the bullet cluster is actually two clusters, two clusters of galaxies that in the past, of course, we, you know, these things are all so big and the, and the interactions are so slow that, that we, everything we see in the sky is basically just a freeze frame in time. From so, a couple of billion years ago. Or well, yeah, like or that. at least a few million years yeah. ago. So it's sometime in the past, and I'm sure that somebody who's studied it could tell you how long ago, but I couldn't. These two clusters pass through each other. Now, the individual galaxies missed, because even, even though galaxies are really big, the distance between them is many times bigger than the size of the galaxy itself. And so the clusters can pass through each other and the individual galaxies mostly don't crash into each other. They just pass they just pass near each other, right? So the the two galaxies cr- cross through each other, but the the gas, the intergalactic medium between the galaxies within this cluster that is basically the size of the of the cluster. And so they did crash into each other and and slowed them down. So you have these two gas clouds passing through each other and they get slowed down by the collision. And so hmm. what they looked for was... Ga- gas hitting gas right. actually slows things down. Yes. That's amazing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and, and, and this is super low density gas, but we're talking scales of, you know, millions of light years across. And okay. So this is... It's this big. Is, it's big. It's big. It's, stuff it's, it's big. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, and in so fact, go ahead. In fact, even though you think about the galaxies as being where most of the mass is, it's not. Because even though this gas is really thin, there's so much of it because yeah. there's so much space between galaxies that the, 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 the gas actually has more mass than the, than the, than the rocks and the little burning the rocks torches. And the, and the, and the, wow. and the stars and stuff. Okay. And so this gave them a, a way to study the, the, where the, because most of the normal mass was in the gas that had been slowed down and was still kind of in the middle. But the dark matter, we thought, should have should have done like what the galaxies did and just passed straight through. Yeah, and so they 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 looked. Um, they did a technique. I, I I don't know if I want to try to explain this, but they just, did just to, have a just technique. Go right ahead. They have just a technique called technique. gravitational lensing. Yeah, where you can look at you can look at light, how light bends as it goes past something with gravity. Sure. So they look at what they call micro lensing of objects behind it to map out where most of the mass is, and then they could uh, use normal techniques like just 
looking at different wavelengths to see where most of the normal matter is. So most of the matter is the gas cloud that's right here, but most of the mass was where the galaxies were, mm. was where the dark matter should be, because it wouldn't have crashed into itself. And so the microlensing told them that the dark matter's here, but the normal optical techniques told them most of the matter was here. And so now you have the first time where not only are you seeing the evidence of the mass from dark matter, but it's not centered where the normal matter is. Because it got have, scraped off like mud off a boot. Exactly. You have dark matter over here and then regular matter over here, and they're not centered on the same point. And so that's the best evidence so far that dark matter is really a thing. And it's not just that we don't understand gravity. Wow. Okay. So, so <laughs> if we drove a Volkswagen in the dark energy, what would happen? Are we still talking about dark oh, matter? Dark matter, sorry. Okay. Dark matter. <laughs> don't, dark don't change the subject. Yeah, sorry. Okay. I was thinking energy of a right. Volkswagen. So um, we don't really know what it's like up close because, you know, all, all we can tell is at the galactic scale, there's a lot of it. And it's a lot of mass, but we think it's really low density. In other words, it, it doesn't clump together into stars the way stars do. It just stays sort of evenly distributed throughout mm -hmm. the galaxy. And so it's probably dark matter right here in this room, but we just I was going to say, is, is there dark matter right here with us it, now? <laughs> okay. It, it may well be, but it's so low density, we can't measure it. Went right through my finger, in fact, it's so low density. <laughs> you, you Went can't. right through the atoms of my finger. <laughs> okay, we're going to take another break in, in 12 seconds. Do you have any final thoughts for us before we come back and talk a little bit more about... What no, dark? he's going to roll yeah. out some X's. And yeah, <laughs> no, we're exactly going to have to right. go. Yeah. We'll be right back. I can't do it that quick. <laughs> Welcome to Statehouse Press, a nonprofit publisher of quality books. Statehouse Press and the McWinnie Foundation Press are part of the Texas A&M University Press Consortium, which handles retail distribution for several small but distinguished publishers. Our entire list of offerings, with pictures, summaries, prices, and easy online ordering, is available in our section of the Consortium website. Statehouse Press is proud of its reputation for high standards of scholarship and readability. In addition to this, we at Statehouse Press have recruited the talents of individuals such as Phil Collins on his book, The Alamo and Beyond. We release not only Texana by contemporary authors, but reprints of classic accounts of Texas life and history otherwise inaccessible to the public. Our book list also incorporates the publications of the McWinney Foundation Press, specializing in the history of the Old South and the Civil War. We strive with our titles to make history accessible to as many readers as possible. To accomplish this task, we have recruited some of America's leading historians as well as bright new scholars. We believe firmly in narrative history, in telling a good story, and in telling it well without losing sight of the people who have made history and the events that changed the nation. For questions or business inquiries, please visit the Texas Book Consortium at www.tamupress.com. This portion of the show is reserved for advertisements. If you are interested in filling this portion with ads for your business, please call 325-793-4686 or email director at tfhcc.com. This portion of the show is reserved for advertisements. If you are interested in filling this portion with ads for your business, please call 325-793-4686 or email director at tfhcc.com. This portion of the show is reserved for advertisements. If you are interested in filling this portion with ads for your business, please call 325-793-4686 or email director at tfhcc.com. And we're back again, and I'm Paul Fabrizio. And I'm Don Frazier, and I'm also slightly confused. <laughs> no. <laughs> no. Yeah, not, yeah. Why, you're still looking for dark matter, well, right? I, I mean, this dark matter thing has got me all kerfluffled. It's weird. Yes. Wayne Keith, space physicist, McMurray space University. Physicist. Yes. Is that what you have on your business card, by the way? No, it just says professor of physics. <sighs> Sorry. Okay. 
We got to get a new business card. That's a space physicist, McMurray. Actually, it says it says associate professor of physics. So I need new business cards anyway. Okay, we need to fix this up. Yeah. All right. So you left us with cluster. What were they? Cluster? Yeah. So we, the, blue, the bullet, the bullet, the bullet clusters. clusters. So the bullet and, clusters are and they pass through they each pass other. through each and other. Scraped off the dark matter, so it clumped up. Well, no, it scraped off the regular matter, the gas. Oh, the gas. The dark matter just passed clean through, like the galaxies did. Okay. So we had the dark matter centered where the galaxies were, and we had the most of the normal Normal matter centered in the middle where they, where they clump together, where the two gas clouds would run into each other. And so, and they do a, a, a density map of the two. You can see that, that the dark matter is here and here, and the normal matter is in the middle, and they're not centered on the same point, which pretty much shoots down all of those modified gravity ideas that, well, you just understand the strength of gravity. Because now, okay, not understanding the strength of gravity is one thing, but you can't change where the gravity is yeah, with no any kidding. of those kind of th theories. Just because you want it to fit your model. Right. Yeah. So so that was that's the best evidence so far that the dark matter is is real and that it's it's really something. And we actually have some ideas of what it might be, you know, when they do those these particle colliders. And I'm not a particle physicist by any means, but you know, they do the high energy particle colliders and it's like they, the one in Switzerland. Like the yeah, yeah. Uh, the or the, the one they were gonna build in the superconducting Texas. super yeah. collider that's that now a mushroom farm, yeah. 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 <laughs> there's there's still a lot of hurt feelings over that even what twenty years later. Yeah. We should have built so, it. We yeah. should we definitely should have built it. Uh, in fact I think um is it Cindy Martin? I think somebody here in our faculty actually was was directly affected by that because like they they tore down their house to in, to, to make to build this yeah, lighter uh, and to build then, the collider and then and then, and then, then they, they didn't ever finish building it. So okay, so okay, so we were at the point where we were pretty sure that dark matter is real because yeah. we don't have. Any other, any other explanation for the bullet cluster? Okay, is, and the, is hang on. He was about to tell us what it's like. I want to know if it comes in a variety of flavors. Okay, we don't we don't know that yet. Okay. But what we we do know is from these particle colliders, these high energy particle colliders, we know that there's lots of types of matter that are not just protons and neutrons and electrons, mm. right? Because when they do these particle collisions, they see all these exotic particles flying off that are created in the in the collision, and then they don't last very long. They go away. And so the idea is that'd well, be like a muon or something. Yeah, like those that? kind of things. Okay. And so at some point, a muon is basically like an electron, but it's just heavier, it has more mass. So okay. it's weird. Um, it the idea is maybe we can find one of these exotic particles that has the right properties and also doesn't like go away immediately. And they have a they have a name for them. It's actually kind of funny. They call them wimps. Wimps. Yeah. And so a wimp is a weakly interacting massive particle. That's a generic term for this type of particle, okay. and and we have discovered some wimps. I couldn't name any, but because uh, <laughs> I'm not a part of this. No, I'm, yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, well, we've all, all right. We've all known some, <laughs> but um, but if you can find one of these weakly interacting massive particles that also has a long lifetime that doesn't just go away right away, then that would be a really good candidate for for what dark matter is actually made of. And, and so, so by not going away immediately, we're talking about it has a shelf life of a nanosecond. Well, I mean, in order to, for dark matter to be a real thing, it has to have been around since the Big Bang, I think, is okay. the idea. So, and so it has to have a, a billions of years shelf life, okay. just like normal matter. Okay. Not like those wimps. Not like, because, yeah, most of, the, most of those exotic particles they find, they just don't last very long. Flashes. So, so I just want to make sure I understand. You're looking for the wimps then to learn more about dark matter? Right. Well, if, if we can discover a wimp that is – has the properties that we need dark matter to have, then we could say, well, let's let's try to figure out if that would fill, fit the bill. Would that work as dark matter? Okay. So what percent of like a galaxy is dark matter? What percent of our galaxy? I want to say it's it's like ninety percent of the mass. Uh, if you're just just looking at just looking at regular matter versus that. dark matter. Yeah. Ninety percent of the Milky Way is made up of something we don't know what it is that we can't measure, exactly. except we have an idea of its mass. We don't know what flavor it is. We right. don't know what it looks like. All, all we know is that it has mass and it doesn't interact with with light. It doesn't give off light. It doesn't emit light. So there's right? something it doesn't so, absorb light. There's something. So it's there. indifferent to light. Yeah. It. It. it yeah. It. And the the weakly interacting part of the wimp is it's it doesn't absorb or emit uh photons it light 
So that's 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 the weakly interacting part. The massive just means it has mass. In the area between the galaxies, is there dark matter there? Yes. And how much of that is dark we matter? We think that dark matter, again, we, we can only kind of map it out by looking doing like this gravitational microlensing kind of stuff and try to map out where, where the gravity is. But it seems to be concentrated wherever galaxies are. Uh, and so, in fact, there's, there's one idea of the way galaxies formed that the dark matter clumped up first after the Big Bang mm -hmm. and the regular matter sort of gravitated literally towards the where the dark matter clumps were and that's why galaxies exist it's because they hmm. coalesced around the clumps of dark matter and so we seem to see dark matter wherever we see galaxies it's the roo in the universal gumbo <laughs> <laughs> there you go uh, so that's now I now i can understand yeah, it makes sense. i understand once it's in terms of gumbo then it's all that's good. right okay okay <laughs> so I mean, there, there's, we, we have less than two minutes left. Yeah. How do you end on something like this? <laughs> well, you I'm, just say, class dismissed, we're out of here. Yeah, just no, think I'm, about this. Well, and I'm thinking that, you know, this also kind of brings us back to the heliopause. Because then what's out there in interstellar space, and it's a whole bunch of stuff that we can't quite tell what it is, but it's a medium of some kind. And it may be composed of dark matter that ended up, causing the, the catalytic event that clustered into yeah, I'm, this is mind blowing stuff. Yeah. It's we're bubbles within bubbles and <laughs> bubbling here and bubbling there. I mean, it's just, and we haven't even got to the weird thing, which is the dark energy, which we're not doing today. That will be another show. We're going to, we, we just have to have to do a teaser though, because that raises <laughs> all sorts of questions about the existence of life mm -hmm. when you really get into it. Yeah. And I, I thought we were all kind of, smart no <laughs> and we don't we apparently don't know much is that a safe thing to say we don't know much that that's a safe when it comes to cosmology it's pretty safe to say that we understand way more than we used to but we are not even close to there as far as understanding you know sooner or later there's going to be this big aha moment and we're going to figure out that we're actually the you know on the side of an awning of a circus somewhere <laughs> or you know something bizarre like that wow that's pretty wild yeah Okay. I mean, for a couple of, you know, humanities and social sciences guys here. This, this, this is really <laughs> mind-blowing stuff. I mean, how often do you, does your mind get blown by stuff in our field? Yeah. Yeah. Reality <laughs> is, in history and political science, not so often. Because they're all past tense. Yeah. I, we're, de we're dealing with human beings and yeah, what we do. Yeah. I love blowing it, students' minds. That's, that's my favorite part about teaching this stuff. Well, you know, it's that's, just like, okay, today I'm going to blow your mind. <laughs> and, and because your mind was blown and, and, oh, sure. and, you know, you guys are humble enough to admit we don't know. It, yeah. I don't pretend to understand any of this stuff and I don't think anybody does fully, you know. All right. So my mind's blown. Y'all's minds are blown. Yours less so. <laughs> you know what? Class dismissed. Mm -hmm.